Section 217 of Chesterfield's Letters to His Son. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Letter 306. London, January 29, 1768. My dear friend, Two days ago I received your letter of the 8th. I wish you had gone a month or six weeks sooner to Basel, that you might have escaped the excessive cold of the most severe winter that I believe was ever known. It congealed both my body and my mind, and scarcely left me the power of thinking. A great many here, both in town and country, have perished by the frost, and been lost in the snow. You have heard, no doubt, of the changes at court, by which you have got a new provincial, Lord Weymouth, who has certainly good parts, and, as I am informed, speaks very well in the House of Lords, but I believe he has no application. Lord Chatham is at his house at Hayes, but sees no mortal. Some say that he has a fit of the gout, which would probably do him good, but many think that his worst complaint is in his head, which I am afraid is too true. Were he well, I am sure he would realize the promise he made me concerning you, but, however, in that uncertainty, I am looking out for any chance borough, and if I can find one, I promise you I will bid like a chapman for it, as I should be very sorry that you were not in the next Parliament. I do not see any probability of any vacancy in a foreign commission in a better climate. Mr. Hamilton at Naples, Sir Horace Mann at Florence, and George Pitt at Turin, do not seem likely to make one. And as for changing your foreign department for a domestic one, it would not be in my power to procure you one, and you would become de veque meunier, and gain nothing in point of climate, by changing a bad one for another full as bad, if not worse, and a worse, I believe, is not than ours. I have always had better health abroad than at home, and if the tattered remnant of my wretched life were worth my care, I would have been in the south of France long ago. I continue very lame and weak, and despair of ever recovering any strength in my legs. I care very little about it. At my age every man must have his share of physical ills of one kind or another, and mine, thank God, are not very painful. God bless you. Letter 307. London, March 12, 1768. My dear friend, the day after I received your letter of the 21st past, I wrote to Lord Weymouth as you desired, and I send you his answer enclosed, from which, though I have not heard from him since, I take it for granted, and so may you, that his silence signifies His Majesty's consent to your request. Your complicated complaints give me great uneasiness, and the more as I am convinced that the Montpellier physicians have mistaken a material part of your case, as indeed all the physicians here did, except Dr. Matti. In my opinion, you have no gout, but a very scorbutic and rheumatic habit of body, which should be treated in a very different manner from the gout. And as I pretend to be a very good quack at least, I would prescribe to you a strict milk diet, with the seeds, such as rice, sago, barley, millet, etc., for the three summer months at least, and without ever tasting wine. If climate signifies anything, in which, by the way, I have very little faith, you are, in my mind, in the finest climate in the world, neither too hot nor too cold, and always clear. You are with the gayest people living, be gay with them, and do not wear out your eyes with reading at home. L'ennui is the English distemper, and a very bad one it is, as I find by every day's experience, for my deafness deprives me of the only rational pleasure that I can have at my age, which is society, so that I read my eyes out every day, that I may not hang myself. You will not be in this Parliament, at least not at the beginning of it. I relied too much upon Lord C.'s promise above a year ago at Bath. He desired that I would leave it to him, that he would make it his own affair, and give it in charge to the Duke of G., whose province it was to make the parliamentary arrangement. This I depended upon, and I think with reason. But since that, Lord C. has neither seen nor spoken to anybody, and has been in the oddest way in the world. I have sent to the Duke of G. to know if L. C. had either spoken or sent him about it, but he assured me that he had done neither, that all was full, or rather running over at present, but that if he could crowd you in upon a vacancy, he would do it with great pleasure." I am extremely sorry for this accident, for I am of a very different opinion from you about being in Parliament, as no man can be of consequence in this country who is not in it. And though one may not speak like a Lord Mansfield or a Lord Chatham, one may make a very good figure in a second rank. Locus as pluribus umbris. I do not pretend to give you any account of the present state of the country or ministry, 
not knowing nor guessing it myself. God bless you, and send you health, which is the first and greatest of all blessings. End of section 217. Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 218 of Chesterfield's Letters to His Son. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Letter 308. London, March 15, 1768. My dear friend, this letter is supplemental to my last. This morning Lord Weymouth very civilly sent Mr. Wood, his first commis, to tell me that the King very willingly gave you leave of absence from your post for a year, for the recovery of your health, but then added, that as the court of Vienna was tampering with that of Saxony, which it seems our court is desirous to contracor her, it might be necessary to have in the interim a charge d'affaires at Dresden, with a defalcation out of your appointment of forty shillings a day, till your return, if I would agree to it. I told him that I consented to both the proposals, upon condition that at your return you should have the character and the pay of a plenipotentiary added to your present character and pay, and that I would completely make up to you the defalcation of the forty shillings a day. He positively engaged for it, and added that he knew that it would be willingly agreed to. Thus I think I have made a good bargain for you, though but an indifferent one for myself, but that is what I never minded in my life. You may therefore append upon receiving from me the full of this defalcation, when and how you please, independently of your usual annual refreshment, which I will pay to M. Larpent whenever you desire it. In the meantime, cura ut valius. The person whom Mr. Wood intimated to me would be the charge d'affaires during your absence is one Mr. Keith, the son of that Mr. Keith who was formerly minister in Russia. Letter 309. London, April 12th, 1768. My dear friend, I received yesterday your letter of the first, in which you do not mention the state of your health, which I desire you will do for the future. I believe you have guessed the true reason of Mr. Keith's mission, but by a whisper that I have since heard, Keith is rather inclined to go to Turin, as charge d'affaires. I forgot to tell you in my last that I was almost positively assured that the instant you return to Dresden, Keith should decamp. I am persuaded that they will keep their words with me, as there is no one reason in the world why they should not. I will send your annual to Mr. Larpent in a fortnight, and pay the forty shillings a day quarterly, if there should be occasion, for in my own private opinion there will be no charge d'affaires sent. I agree with you that point d'argent, point d'allemande, as was used to be said, and not without more reason, of the Swiss, but as we have neither the inclination nor, I fear, the power to give subsidies, the court of Vienna can give good things that cost them nothing, as archbishoprics, bishoprics, besides corrupting their ministers and favorites with places. Elections here have been carried on to a degree of frenzy hitherto unheard of. That for the town of Northampton has cost the contending parties at least thirty thousand pounds a side, and has sold his borough of, to two members, for nine thousand pounds. As soon as Wilkes had lost his election for the city, he set up for the country of Middlesex and carried it hollow, as the jockeys say. Here were great mobs and riots upon that occasion, and most of the windows in town broke, that had no lights for Wilkes and Liberty, who were thought to be inseparable. He will appear, the tenth of this month, in the court of King's Bench, to receive his sentence, and then great riots are again expected, and probably will happen. God bless you. Letter 310 Bath, October 17, 1768. My dear friend, your last two letters, to myself and Grevenkopf, have alarmed me extremely, but I comfort myself a little by hoping that you, like all people who suffer, think yourself worse than you are. A dropsy never comes so suddenly, and I flatter myself that it is only that gouty or rheumatic humor which has plagued you so long, that has occasioned the temporary swelling of your legs. Above forty years ago, after a violent fever, my legs swelled as much as you describe yours to be. I immediately thought that I had a dropsy, but the faculty assured me that my complaint was only the effect of my fever, and would soon be cured, and they said true. Pray let your amanuensis, whoever he may be, write an account regularly once a week, either to Grevenkop or myself, for that is the same thing, of the state of your health. 
I sent you, in four successive letters, as much of the Duchess of Somerset's snuff as a letter could well convey to you. Have you received all or any of them, and have they done you any good? Though in your present condition you cannot go into company, I hope that you have some acquaintances that come and sit with you. For if originally it was not good for a man to be alone, it is much worse for a sick man to be so. He thinks too much of his distemper and magnifies it. Some men of learning among the ecclesiastics, I dare say, would be glad to sit with you, and you could give them as good as they brought. Poor Hart, who is here still, is in a most miserable condition. He has entirely lost the use of his left side, and can hardly speak intelligibly. I was with him yesterday. He inquired after you with great affection, and was in the utmost concern when I showed him your letter. My own health is as it has been ever since I was here last year. I am neither well nor ill, but unwell. I have in a manner lost the use of my legs, for, though I can make a shift to crawl upon even ground for a quarter of an hour, I cannot go up or down stairs, unless supported by a servant. God bless and grant you a speedy recovery. Note. This is the last of the letters of Lord Chesterfield to his son, Mr. Philip Stanhope, who died in November, 1768. The unexpected and distressing intelligence was announced by the lady to whom Mr. Stanhope had been married for several years, unknown to his father. On learning that the widow had two sons, the issue of this marriage, Lord Chesterfield took upon himself the maintenance of his grandchildren. The letters which follow show how happily the writer adapted himself to the trying situation. End of section 218. Read by Professor Heather and by. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 219 of Chesterfield's Letters to His Son. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Letter 311. To Mrs. Stanhope, then at Paris. London, March 16, 1769. Madam, a troublesome and painful inflammation in my eyes obliges me to use another hand than my own to acknowledge the receipt of your letter from Avignon of the 27th past. I am extremely surprised that Mrs. du Boucher should have any objection to the manner in which your late husband desired to be buried, and which you very properly complied with. All I desire for my own burial is not to be buried alive, but how or where, I think, must be entirely indifferent to every rational creature." I have no commission to trouble you with, during your stay at Paris, from whence I wish you and the boys a good journey home, where I shall be very glad to see you all, and assure you of my being, with great truth, your faithful, humble servant, Chesterfield. Letter 312. To the same at London. Madam, the last time that I had the pleasure of seeing you, I was so taken up in playing with the boys that I forgot their more important affairs. How soon would you have them placed at school? When I know your pleasure as to that, I will send to Monsieur Perny to prepare everything for their reception. In the meantime, I beg that you will equip them thoroughly with clothes, linen, etc., all good but plain, and give me the account, which I will pay, for I do not intend that, from this time forward, the two boys should cost you one shilling. I am, with great truth, madam, your faithful, humble servant, Chesterfield." Letter 313. Madam, as some day must be fixed for sending the boys to school, do you approve of the 8th of next month? By which time the weather will probably be warm and settled, and you will be able to equip them completely. I will upon that day send my coach to you, to carry you and the boys to Longborough House, with all their immense baggage. I must recommend to you, when you leave them there, to suppress, as well as you can, the overgrowings of maternal tenderness, which would grieve the poor boys the more, and give them a terror of their new establishment. I am with great truth, madam, your faithful, humble servant, Chesterfield. Letter 314. Bath, October 11th, 1769. Madam, nobody can be more willing and ready to obey orders than I am, but then I must like the orders and the orderer. Your orders and yourself come under this description, and therefore I must give you an account of my arrival in existence, such as it is here. I got hither last Sunday, the day after I left London, less fatigued than I expected to have been, and now crawl about this place upon my three legs, but am kept in countenance by many of my fellow-crawlers. The last part of the Sphinx's riddle approaches, 
and I shall soon end as I began upon all fours. When you happen to see either Monsieur or Madame Perny, I beg you will give them this melancholic proof of my caducity, and tell them that the last time I went to see the boys, I carried the Michaelmas quarterage in my pocket, and when I was there I totally forgot it, but assure them that I have not the least intention to bilk them, and will pay them faithfully the two quarters together at Christmas. I hope our two boys are well, for then I am sure you are so. I am, with great truth and esteem, your most faithful, humble servant, Chesterfield. Letter 315. Bath, October 28, 1769. Madam, your kind anxiety for my health and life is more than, in my opinion, they are both worth. Without the former, the latter is a burden, and indeed I am very weary of it. I think I have got some benefit by drinking these waters, and by bathing, for my old stiff rheumatic limbs, for, I believe, I could now outcrawl a snail, or perhaps even a tortoise. I hope the boys are well. Phil, I dare say, has been in some scrapes, but he will get triumphantly out of them, by dint of strength and resolution. I am, with great truth and esteem, your most faithful, humble servant, Chesterfield. Letter 316. Bath, November 5, 1769. Madam, I remember very well the paragraph which you quote from a letter of mine to Mrs. Du Boucher, and see no reason yet to retract that opinion, in general, which at least nineteen widows and twenty had authorized. I had not then the pleasure of your acquaintance. I had seen you but twice or thrice, and I had no reason to think that you would deviate, as you have done, from other widows, so much as to put perpetual shackles upon yourself for the sake of your children. But if I may use a vulgarism, one swallow makes no summer. Five righteous were formerly necessary to save a city, and they could not be found. So, till I find four more such righteous widows as yourself, I shall entertain my former notions of widowhood in general. I can assure you that I drink here very soberly and cautiously, and at the same time keep so cool a diet that I do not find the least symptom of heat, much less of inflammation. By the way, I never had that complaint, in consequence of having drank these waters, for I have had it but four times, and always in the middle of summer. Mr. Hawkins is timorous, even to minutia, and my sister delights in them. Charles will be a scholar, if you please, but our little Philip, without being one, will be something or other as good, though I do not yet guess what. I am not of the opinion generally entertained in this country, that man lives by Greek and Latin alone, that is, by knowing a great many words of two dead languages, which nobody living knows perfectly, and which are of no use in the common intercourse of life. Useful knowledge, in my opinion, consists of modern languages, history, and geography. Some Latin may be thrown into the bargain, in compliance with custom, and for closet amusement. You are by this time certainly tired with this long letter, which I could prove to you from Horace's own words, for I am a scholar, to be a bad one, he says that water-drinkers can write nothing good, so I am, with real truth and esteem, your most faithful, humble servant, Chesterfield. End of section 219. Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 220 of Chesterfield's Letters to His Son read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Letter 317. Bath, October 9, 1770. Madam, I am extremely obliged to you for the kind part which you take in my health and life. As to the latter, I am as indifferent myself as any other body can be. But as to the former, I confess care and anxiety, for while I am to crawl upon this planet, I would willingly enjoy the health at least of an insect. How far these waters will restore me to that moderate degree of health, which alone I aspire at, I have not yet given them a fair trial, having drank them but one week. The only difference I hitherto find is, that I sleep better than I did. I beg that you will neither give yourself, nor Mr. Fitzhugh, much trouble about the pine plants, for as it is three years before they fruit, I might as well at my age plant oaks, and hope to have the advantage of their timber. However, somebody or other, God knows who, will eat them, as somebody or other will fell and sell the oaks I planted five and forty years ago. I hope our boys are well. My respects to them both. I am, with the greatest truth, your faithful and humble servant, Chesterfield. Letter 318. Bath, November 4th, 1770. 
madam, the post has been more favorable to you than I intended it should, for upon my word I answered your former letter the post after I had received it. However, you have got a loss, as we say sometimes in Ireland. My friends from time to time require bills of health from me in these suspicious times, when the plague is busy in some parts of Europe. All I can say, in answer to their kind inquiries, is that I have not the distemper properly called the plague, but that I have all the plague of old age and of a shattered carcass. These waters have done me what little good I expected from them, though by no means what I could have wished, for I wished them to be les eaux de jouvence. I had a letter the other day from our two boys. Charles's was very finely written, and Philip's very prettily. They are both perfectly well, and say that they want nothing. What grown-up people will or can say as much? I am with the truest esteem, madam, your most faithful servant, Chesterfield. Letter 319. Bath, October 27, 1771. Madam, upon my word you interest yourself in the state of my existence more than I do myself, for it is worth the care of neither of us. I ordered my valet de chambre, according to your orders, to inform you of my safe arrival here, to which I can add nothing, being neither better nor worse than I was then. I am very glad that our boys are well. Pray give them the enclosed. I am not at all surprised at Mr. Conversion, for he was, at seventeen, the idol of old women, for his gravity, devotion, and dullness. I am, madam, your most faithful, humble servant, Chesterfield. Letter 320. To Charles and Philip Stanhope. I received a few days ago the two best written letters that I ever saw in my life. The one signed Charles Stanhope, the other Philip Stanhope. As for you, Charles, I did not wonder at it, for you will take pains, and are a lover of letters. But you, idle rogue, you Phil, how came you to write so well that one can almost say of you two, et cantare porus et respondre parati? Charles will explain this Latin to you. I am told, Phil, that you have got a nickname at school, from your intimacy with Master Strangeways, and that they call you Master Strangeways, for to be rude you are a strange boy. Is this true? Tell me what you would have me bring you both from hence, and I will bring it to you when I come to town. In the meantime, God bless you both. Chesterfield End of section 220 End of Letters to His Son on the Art of Becoming a Man of the World and a Gentleman by Philip Stanhope, 4th Earl of Chesterfield Read by Professor Heather and By in Carrollton, Georgia, in 2010, in January 2011 for more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.